Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Brookings uh, for the event called What Universities Owe Democracy. Um, this morning, it is my honor to welcome Ronald Daniels, a distinguished educator with a long career in educational leadership. And he is currently the 14th president of Johns Hopkins University, the author of four books. And today he is with, with us to discuss his latest book called What Universities Owe Democracy. Um, before we go to um, Ron, I'd like to just point out that if you wanna submit a question, do so by emailing events at brookings.edu or via Twitter at, at brookingsgov by using hashtag strengthening democracy. Okay, so hopefully you will submit some questions and we will have a, a short discussion with Ron and then get to your questions. So um, Ron, uh, today I want to walk through your book a little bit, okay? It's a book that couldn't come too soon. It's in the last decade, we've seen a democratic recession around the world and the biggest threat to our own de democracy in, his, in the history of the country, and that, of course, was on January 6th. It's prompted many of us here at Brookings and at other places to concentrate on what exactly it takes to strengthen a democracy and to understand what, it, what, makes, what makes a healthy democracy. Your book is invaluable to those of us who are in the fight to protect democracy. As far as I can see, it proceeds in four parts. Um, colleges and universities are essential to liberal democracy. They didn't always take on this role. It's something that's come over time. And in recent decades, there's, there's some faltering in this role. And finally, as institutions, universities are inextricably intertwined with democracy and they have a responsibility to act in defense of democracy. So let's break down the pieces of this um, and take a look at some of the arguments you make in the book. Um, the first thing you do is you link universities to the achievement of the American dream and to upward mobility. And you argue that upward, mobi upward educational mobility exerts an even firmer grasp on American society than socioeconomic mobility. And then you go on to explain the history of college admissions and with a particular emphasis, which I loved on legacy admissions. Talk to us about what happened to college admissions and why you see legacy admissions as so damaging to the democratic ideal. Well, uh, first, Elaine, uh, let me just say uh, how thrilled I am to uh, be here and to be able to have a chance to chat with you about uh, some of these issues. And, and, you know, in particular, as I've been thinking a lot about the role of universities and colleges in undergirding our uh, democratic system of governance, you think about us as one set of institutions, but you are aware that there are a host of other institutions like think tanks, like Brookings, for instance, that play an absolutely indispensable role as well. So it's really wonderful to be able to be here and to be able to converse with you as a representative of an institution that I have a great deal of respect for. It's informed a lot of your working papers and studies over the years have informed a lot of my research. So um, this is a distinct honor. So. Having said that, um, when you think about uh, the role of um, college admissions, you know that it is um, an important part of the story of how we give people the opportunity to transcend their circumstances. And there's you know, a clear understanding that if you get a university education, uh, it's not only that you get access to enhanced earning power, but you get enhanced access to a host of different benefits. Um, you're much less likely to be unemployed, to go through uh, periods of unemployment than someone who does not have a college education. Your uh, life expectancy increases, your sense of uh, happiness, um, family stability on a host of different dimensions. It's absolutely clear that this is a very valued and a profound intervention that changes dramatically the trajectory of one's life. So given, um, given how important this is, the question is how are we doing as a system in ensuring broad access? And in particular, uh, being true to the 
uh, Jeffersonian ideal of equal opportunity to the notion that the most meritorious um, among us in our country are uh, given access to this opportunity where they can take maximum advantage of this. And for decades, um, I, th I, th I think one can very persuasively make the case that higher education was really effective in broadening access to low and middle income students. Uh, from the college boom in the first half of the 19th century to the expansion of public land grant universities in the 20th century, to visionary legislation like the passage of the GI Bill and the Higher Education Act, colleges and universities with vigorous federal and state support made a world-class education available for millions. But having said that, we could see that starting in the 1980s, something started to shift in this country. And that was an era that really marked um, a tightening of access one defined by entrenched divides between the haves and have-nots in the academy. And a gulf um, has widened between well-resourced schools for the wealthy and struggling and lower quality schools for the poor. And as a result, many parts of the academy have become places of entrenched privilege. Um, as of a few years ago, and this is a staggering statistic, nearly 40 selective universities enrolled more students from the top 1% of incomes than the bottom 60% of incomes. I mean, that's just a staggering statistic and really gives lie to the idea of equal opportunity being properly uh, vindicated in this country. Now, some of this has occurred um, as a result of squeezed budgets and diminished aid. State support for higher education was cut between 1992 and 2010 and is in truth in real terms only recovered slightly since. Uh, federal support for higher education has stagnated and I'm encouraged that the president in his recent budget has proposed a doubling of Pell assistance. But in the 1970s, the Pell grant covered almost 70% of the average cost of college attendance. And today at current levels, it covers only about 25%. So one after another, universities in this era have announced the reversal of their near need blind admission policies in the wake of financial uncertainty. And you know, there's things that universities are doing quite apart from the receipt of federal assistance or state assistance that has, I think, compounded the problem. And one of them is the one that you referred to a few moments ago, and that's legacy admissions where essentially this is a policy where colleges give an advantage in the admissions process to children or grandchildren of alumni. And since um, uh, uh, the children of alumni are far more likely than their peers to be wealthy and white, legacy admissions amount to immobility writ large as policy with universities placing a thumb on the scale for students solely because of their privileged position of the standing of their parents or their grandparents. And this of course comes after a whole host of other benefits that these kids have received in terms of more stable families, higher incomes, better neighborhoods, better schools, better opportunities, all the things that we know come with the receipt of a college education. And so the advantage is really quite significant. One 2004 study estimated that legacy status afforded applicants to highly selective universities an admissions boost equivalent to about 160 SAT points out of 1600. So, you know, universities value deeply the contributions and the commitments of their alumni. But what we have discovered is that alumni also along for their institutions to be places where they are connected to ideals of mobility, equal opportunity, and embodiments of merit for all talented students. It isn't just about, can you get my kid in? It's also something more than that. And here um, we speak from, at least I speak from experience. In 2009, our university had a legacy program in place so that we were among these institutions as putting the thumb on the scale for uh, students who were the children or grandchildren of alumni. And in 2009, our university had more legacy students in its freshman class, about 12.5% of the class, than students who were eligible for Pell Grants, 9%. So you just, you, you see in very clear terms, uh, this, um, this trade-off. And we ended legacy admissions quietly in 2014. We announced it publicly um, a few years later after we knew the experiment would work. 
But by 2020, these numbers were dramatically reversed. 4.2% of first year students had a legacy connection to the university. But to say they had a legacy connection, they were in no way the beneficiary of any particular preference. They just got in on their own merits. Um, and 20.5% of the class was Pell eligible. Um, and over the same period, the uh, percent of first generation in our incoming classes has more than doubled from seven to 16%. So, you know, admit, college admissions are a zero sum game. If you want to open up more opportunities for students of disadvantage, you've got to think about whether you're doing things that, whether intentionally or not, are systematically creating barriers to their involvement and unfairly um, advantaging other students. And again, I think legacies is, is, is such a dramatic and in truth indefensible practice that, um, that really needs to go um, in, this, in this age. You know, uh, just legacies for a minute. I've heard college administrators argue that the reason for legacy admissions is to build a sort of familial affection for the institution, which then results in sort of long-term financial support. Um, is there anything to that? So, you know, that's the best argument you can make. And, you know, to just to, you know, give it its fullest expression, it is, you know, this is a wonderful way of doing great things for less advantaged students because you create this coterie of donors and they're able to, because of their affection, they're going to give more and transfer uh, funds to low-income students, and so and so it goes. And look, you know, for, uh, first and foremost, when we ended legacies, um, quite apart from the enormous philanthropy that we have been the beneficiary of from Mike Bloomberg, who, of course, one point eight billion dollar gift, unprecedented gift, allowed us to support financially. But even if you take out. Mike Bloomberg's uh, amazing giving to Johns Hopkins, um, the, um, the level of alumni support for the university has increased, not decreased in a, in a time in which we reverse legacy preferences. And in some sense, you know, Mike's story is a powerful um, statement of what one individual who came in without any legacy connections, came from a distinctly middle-class uh, family, uh, what, what his affection and commitment was able to do to the institution. So as much as you can focus on, you know, those obvious uh, students who are in, have, have enjoyed and their families have enjoyed intergenerational privilege, you know, it turns out that a person like Mike, and there's lots of stories like this, who really experienced firsthand what it means to be a first gen student at university and how that changed life and the level of affection turns out can be also manifested in very significant ways for the university. I should say, you know, a university like MIT, which is uh, which which has decades not had legacy admissions, seems to be doing pretty well in terms of their development campaign. Um, uh, despite that. And maybe, in fact, it's because of this commitment. So I, I think there's a shift here that can be affected and need not damage the uh, alumni uh, support. And, and there's one, one other thing before we go on to the next that, that struck me is the ups and downs in SATs and use of standardized tests. Can you talk, talk about that? Because it seems to go, seems to have been in waves in terms of the people's dependence on it. Where, where do you come out on standardized tests? So, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a great and it's a very um, important question for the moment because we're going through another, as you say, we're in another moment where we're thinking fundamentally uh, the value of ACT and SAT uh, testing. And we have been through the, we like so many other institutions through the pandemic have been test optional. And, you know, we're finding that a significant percentage of our students till, still can uh, still take standardized testing. But increasingly, there's a you know there's a group of applicants that aren't, um, and I think it, in some ways what it is what that is a result of is not just simply reflecting the problems with administering the test in a pandemic environment. There is a lot of literature on the bias of standardized testing, the extent to which it really unfairly disadvantages students from certain backgrounds, and so it's an imperfect proxy. 
But I will say, on the other hand, I'm I'm ambivalent about this because you know I um, you know I come from uh, Canada, and you know there is no standardized testing, and um, many uh, have seen this as one of the great um, strengths of the Canadian system, as you just basically get in on your high school grades and um, and you know relatively modest supplementary information, and at one level that looks simpler and more attractive. But on the other hand, what it's also meant is that, you know, in the way that um, the privileged tend to be very effective at sharing a good leg up for their kids is there's been a, you know, a steady growth over the years in high schools in Canada, which uh, cater to the affluent, which basically just ensure that the kids are going to graduate with staggering grades and without a standardized test to be able to level it, um, you're compromised. So it's, it's, it's it's a it's 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 not it's not a simple um, issue to resolve. And what's even interesting now, and see how dynamic it, um, all this is. I was just talking to my director of admissions yesterday, saying there's now a movement underfoot at the SAT to really rethink the test and try and respond to a lot of the frailties that have been uh, pitted against it, and even to shorten the test. Um, take out certain sections where the uh, concerns of, of bias have been most acute. So, th- you know, this is very much, a, I, I think, a story in progress. I know I, I heard stories how back in the 1930s and 40s, early standardized tests asked you questions about opera and th- things, right. things like that, that, you know, no working Clearly. class kid was going to know about. Um, right. Um, okay, so let's go on to, you know, sort of the second big theme in the book, which is that democracies cannot exist without good citizens. And universities play a critical role in the creation of citizens. So how did universities come to play this role? I think that's a sort of fascinating story. And then what's happened to the education of Americans as citizens in recent decades to, to change that role? Um, and then, then I want to ask you about the democracy requirement and tell you a little story about what seems to be happening to us here at Brookings. But, but fill us in about universities and citizen education. So it's a it's a really it's a really important area uh, as one thinks about how you build successful democracies, and it starts with the recognition that um, being a good citizen, understanding what are the obligations of citizenship, understanding how. Um, government operates, the rationales for government, the role of liberal democracy, this idea that that it is simultaneously serving the goals of equality and freedom, all of these things aren't, you know, are not inherited traits. It's, it's, it's not like you, you naturally become a good citizen, you have to educate for it. And so then the question is, who's responsible for uh, conferring that education on uh, young citizens? And here, you know, research on civic education has borne out clearly the claim that educational institutions, not surprisingly, play a critical role in the formation of good democratic citizens. In fact, the data shows that um, the most healthy and prosperous liberal democracies are also the countries which have the most robust civic education levels and international exams. Um, And here, you know, clearly part of the responsibility, a major part of the responsibility resides with K to 12 education, but also universities uh, can play a critical role. And, you know, um, in the United States, one of the things that I've become quite concerned about is the fact that If you look at the percentage of students who have had a meaningful exposure to civics education and understand the nature of government, the rationales for democracy, as opposed to authoritarian structures of government and so forth, and think about the kinds of skills and competencies they need to thrive in it, it turns out that only about 25% of high school students in the United States are graduating with any grasp of these issues, have had any exposure. And so the fact that, you know, more than 70% of students graduating from high school will go on to post-secondary education, at least to my mind, that while we're trying to fix the K to 12 problem, which must be fixed, 
um, we have an important role to play, even if remedial, in ensuring that students are not uh, leaving our institutions without these skills. And so it's here that if you look at um, you know, uh, the ways in which so many different um, uh, political thinkers, um, elected officials have thought about uh, universities, it's absolutely clear that they understood uh, the importance of higher education to citizenship training. And nearly all the founding fathers, in fact, had that understanding. James Madison tried to put a federal university actually into, write it into the constitution. George Washington fought tirelessly to build a national university to teach Republican principles. Um, in fact, devoting much of his first State of the Union to that very proposal. And Thomas Jefferson, of course, founded the University of Virginia in part to get at this uh, uh, idea of citizen uh, training. Um, since the founding, I think US colleges have um, across history tried to live up to this ideal from moral education in the 19th century to the rise of scientific reasoning as an anchor for citizenship to the general education programs of the early 20th century. But the truth is that all of these episodes of engagement with this responsibility, with this challenge, ultimately ended up in sort of running out of steam and sputtering and so, you know, in the face of new priorities or, um, you know, the challenges from within the internal fabric of the university, um, the, uh, the efforts lapsed. And what's been interesting, at least, and I talk about within the book is from the 1980s onward, um, much of the effort for us to think about how we vindicate our role in citizen education has been around the idea of community service. And we've developed service learning as one of the kind of cornerstones in the way in which we engage this issue of our responsibilities to, uh, to, uh, to communities. And there's no doubt that we've been successful in really um, imbuing a sense of um, engagement with community and viewing a sense of civic responsibility in terms of doing volunteer work and so forth. But having said that, the fundamentals of citizenship, of understanding the formal mechanisms of government, how governments make decisions, and your role as a citizen in those formal institutions, it's clear that we faltered. We haven't taken that seriously. And as a consequence, it's clear that although our students are great on volunteerism, even their engagement with formal political institutions um, is much less developed. And I think that leaves us vulnerable. You know, when you read these statistics about students who increasingly graduating students, young Americans, who are increasingly indifferent to authoritarian, strongman views of government as opposed to democracy, you know, that's a wake up call of saying we can't be indifferent to this and we and we have to very deliberately educate for this responsibility. So this is where I end up calling for some kind of formal effort at education uh, for uh, for for the responsibilities of citizenship, which I think is both substantive knowledge as well as as well as skills development. And that, and that's what you call, that's what you call in the book a democracy requirement for graduation, yeah. which I think is just fascinating. And you know, I, I've been at Brookings for nearly ten years, and I thought I was coming to a think tank, and I was going to do you know serious political science, et cetera, which which I have committed some serious political science. But along the way, and I it, the the whole institution I think found itself in fulfilling a role that it never saw before, which is public education. And all of a sudden, you know, we'd publish a, a simple, we started publishing what we call explainers, policy explainers. And we'd publish a simple thing like, you know, a thousand words on why it's so difficult to count undocumented aliens, right? Just all the methodological things. We got half a million hits on it. Right. And, and all of our, all of these things started going through the roof and my hypothesis is that one of the reasons is there was such a that we've hit a generation. By the way, our readership is average readership is about age is about thirty five. Um, we've hit a generation who was deprived in high school and in college of basic civic literacy and American history. 
Because also when we, we put forth some piece of American history, that gets a lot of readers. And that uh, surprisingly to, I think, all of us at Brookings, we are now somewhat in the public education business. Um, and I think that's a reflection of the dearth of citizen democracy that you were talking about. Um, that let me then go on to, and I, and I love this idea of a democracy requirement. Of course, any political scientist would, um, <laughs> any political and, scientist in the history. And, 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 you know, we're, and we're having at Hopkins, um, we've done some, some easy moves in terms of, you know, first, first year orientation. The first week we're exposing kids to issues of, uh, around the challenges of democracy and the nature of the democratic experiment. Um, uh, but that's right now it's confirmed to orientation and I really am hoping that we're going to be able to build at least a um, an inventory of courses where they can base basically choose things of interest in them but nevertheless we know that upon graduation they have some command of these issues and and so that hopefully when you know you publish your um, uh, various um, explainers. <laughs> explainers these are updates or reminders for them but not you know the, uh, first not introduction the first and and again, it's just, I think that all of the key institutions in American society that can touch this, we've just got to take this seriously, particularly in terms of the state of peril that we feel both domestically and internationally of the standing of democracy. I, you know, I think my low point here was during the first impeachment when a young woman, I could tell she was young by her voice, um, called me up, she was a journalist and she wanted to know about impeachment and wanted to know, well, is there anything that I can read about it? I said, well, you know, why don't you start with Article Two of the Constitution? <laughs> That's a good starting point. And this was news, right? This yeah. was news. So, all righty. Um, by the way, I'm jumping ahead a little bit to something you talked about in your last chapter, but it seems to me related to this, you mentioned not just the substance, but the practice of democracy. And later on in the book, you talk about the dearth of debates on campus, how they, people have, you know, there's a lot of attention to the fact that some, some speakers are shooed off campus, et cetera, but the absence of debate. And debate seems to me to be something or civilized debate, let's say, is something we are sadly list, you know, lacking in our current democracy. And students aren't exposed to a right winger and a left winger talking about welfare or talking about immigration or you know talking about any of these hot button issues. Um, why did that happen? Do the universities just too afraid of debates? So you know it's it's a it's a it's really interesting um, how we get to where we have gone to on this issue. And it you know it starts off as as you say as really thinking about how you are able within the context of the four years that students, and again, it's 70% of Americans are going to some kind of post-secondary education. So you, you, know, you think about this moment where you've got increasingly more diverse, more heterogeneous classes, and yet um, what is happening is, you know, as to the question of debates that instead of students going to events where they're confronting other views of seeing how your views or people who would articulate your views interact with critics or those who have competing views, what we're finding is that the students are just going to single speaker events. And so the, you know, the problems that we see in America with geographic separation, that all, you know, the, the documented evidence that we're living increasingly in homogeneous enclaves where we're sharing this, you know, uh, our lives with people who should have the same socioeconomic or um, backgrounds or political views as us, you know, this re represents um, a continuation albeit on a campus where there's lots of contiguity with others, but we're not encouraging that kind of interaction. And those, those moments where you can see, you can see debate and see different views and, and have those challenges. And so, um, you know, I don't think, um, you know, as a, in comparison to, let's say, Great Britain, where there's just a much stronger tradition of debating societies and so forth, that's much more central to the undergraduate experience. I don't think it's as well developed in the United States, although there are clearly, there have been moments when these kind of clubs 
and programs existed on campus, but nevertheless, they have, I think, uh, ended up being supplanted by these other sort of more um, homogeneous events where, where it's a single speaker. And, and so here, um, you know, one of the, one of the recommendations, it's a, it's a very practical recommendation, but it's, is basically for universities to ensure that there's just a lot of funding and support for student groups and others to basically um, bring in panels, debates where there's a multiplicity of views. And so that, again, it has a virtue of exposing students to different views um, on that panel, but it also has a virtue of bringing students from a number of different walks of life together that you're in the same room instead of constantly reinforcing uh, your um, identity as a member of a particular group um, or enclave. And then, you know, and then just related to that, Elena goes to something outside of uh, the uh, issue of debates. But uh, but I, 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 an issue that I think is very important is even um, encouraging students or insisting that stu students right from the time they enter university end up being uh, in rooms with sharing rooms and uh, residence facilities with people who are different than they are. And for the last several decades, American universities have essentially allowed uh, students to choose their first year roommates rather than the university doing it for them. And surprise, surprise, you know, what students are doing in advance of coming to university is they're finding a lot of students who look just like them, who share the similar views. So, so you know, here it's just this really totally frustrating situation where we've created very diverse campuses in terms of representation, and yet we have been complicit in allowing students socially and even intellectually to self-segregate and to perpetuate the very kind of micro communities which they're leaving behind. And so, you know, that's that that's something that again, I think we can disrupt and we have a responsibility to disrupt so that that the experience of being in ideally in this very intense pluralistic community for four years where you're living cheek by jowl with people who are dis distinctly different from you, but somehow figuring out how you get along just in spite of those differences is, is really important. You know, um, I, um, this was eye-opening to me, the emergence of different levels of housing on campus, that in other words, there was expensive housing, probably with all sorts of cable TV and wonderful stuff, and then there was cheap dormitory housing. Now, I went to Bryn Mawr many, many, many moons ago, but, and I was on scholarship, but I had the same dorm room as the girl down the hall. And the only reason way I knew she was rich was she brought her horse to college. And I thought that was kind of amazing to even have a horse, let alone bring your horse to college. Right. So, um, but you know, that, that I think, I, I mean, this really hit me in the book, the, the segregation by class, by ideology, on the college campus, and again, going back to this education for democracy, is you don't learn to interact with people who are not like you. So no wonder you can't stand each other. I taught at Harvard for many years before coming to Brookings, and at one point I brought Grover Norquist, the head of the taxpayers union, who was a very, very ultra conservative guy, to speak to my class. Oh my God, you would have thought I brought Satan himself into class. They were all expecting some, I was going to bring in some liberal Democrat. They wanted me to bring in Hillary Clinton, which I know her, but I couldn't have gotten her there anyway. <laughs> and instead I got, they got Grover Norquist. And, you know, they're so used to being in, in their bubble that it, it does hurt democracy. I, I do think it's, I, I think of all the things in the book that really hit me as something, because that's the informal behavioral side of democracy. Uh, you know, and, and it turns out, you know, as we think about, you know, this broad problem of, you know, the, the fragility of democracy, which in truth, you know, my background, as you know, is as a lawyer and as a legal academic. 
And we tend to think, you know, laws, institutions matter, they change uh, human behavior, they can inculcate certain types of behaviors. And, you know, one of the things that particularly in culminating in January 6th is to see the extent to which you know, these are still um, very fragile um, arrangements and norms can undo them. That, that So that we've got to, in some sense, if you can't be assured just by virtue of having a constitution or a set of governmental arrangements that they're necessarily going to be self-perpetuating, you've you've got to you've got to um, support them, embellish them, and you know um, sometimes the task of how you can actually in all of our roles how you can make a difference, it seems, well, it, the, the phenomenon is so overwhelming as to see, you know, the changing views towards democracy and polarization and all the things that we lament often. But, you know, something like looking at small concrete things you can do, but something like moving to mandatory uh, um, first year roommate selection instead of letting the students do it, that we do it, it turns out that something as simple as that has a profound effect on, and this has been documented empirically, but on one's capacity for uh, thinking about how you manage difference, it ex um, and it, it has had a, um, a significant effect on ideology and political activity through life. So it's a small perturbation, but it turns out to have really significant effects in terms of, again, just building, uh, you know, ideas of tolerance and civic friendship. So it's, it's just, for me, it's just this moment where I think all of us should really be thinking about the big, but also the very small and concrete ways in which you can, you can make a difference. Okay. So one final topic I want to get to before we go to audience questions is um, the fact that we've all lamented the demise of facts in public life, right? And Donald Trump introduced us to the news, to the term fake news. And now, of course, around the world, everybody, including Vladimir Putin, talks about fake news. And the internet has really allowed fact and fiction to circulate globally, because there are no editors anymore, right? And you take a, a good hard look at the role of universities as what you call fact Cultivate, cultivating enterprises, which I think is, is sort of a mouthful, but it's also quite accurate. Um, American universities didn't start out as research organizations, however, and that was a surprise to me. Um, when did they become research organizations and what are they facing now? Because I think this is one of the most important pieces of your, of your work here is, is the really the threats to research and taking, and therefore the doubts that have been sown about the research um, agenda or a research project. Well, Lainey, it really goes to what you said a moment ago is that we know um, with the uh, proliferation of social media and the you know, much more rapid uh, dissemination of, of fake news rather than accurate news, you know, uh, falsity over truth turns out to have much more uh, uh, velocity on the internet. And so we know we're in a world, you know, quite apart from all the balkanization that we, we talk about in terms of cable news networks and so forth. And so, you know, it's in that setting that, you know, you got to look at the institutions that, that ultimately are charged with being uh, scrupulously objective, really committed to the idea that there are such a thing as facts, as truths, and that um, one can look to those institutions as uh, places where claims can be tested and whether they're being made in social media or whether they're being made by elected officials or business leaders, um, that there's a test of whether or not this is, that, that these are true claims or not. And obviously, um, one does not want to uh, see actions, interventions being made on, um, on foundations that are false um, and, and lack 
uh, substance. So that's an important role for universities. It's not just universities, of course. I think media and I think institutions like yours play a really important role in that enterprise as well. But um, as you said, it wasn't a it wasn't um, a role that came naturally to us or uh, um, or very quickly to us because originally American universities were just teaching colleges. And the addition of research in the sense that we had certain activities that we would undertake in pursuit of truth and to unearth new knowledge and preserve knowledge came later on. And here, it's a little self-indulgent, but you asked the question, this, this is a story for the role that Johns Hopkins played as really the first university in the United States that took the German model of universities and grafted it into American soil. But with, with, with Johns Hopkins uh, essentially taking on a research function focused on graduate education, really building a number of rigorous scholarly communities and in the, in, um, the humanities and the sciences and so forth, that really has ultimately changed the character of universities in the United States and really given us this role as, as, as creators and stewards of fact. Having said that, the thing that I am concerned about in the book is that given how important it is that you have a neutral arbiter, a place that people can go to and trust the truth claims that are being made by those institutions, one of the things that I think is really distressing is that um, um, in terms of our own published research, that um, we are increasingly having problems in terms of reproducing uh, the findings of, of research studies um, in the social sciences as well as in the hard sciences. And so, you know, there's a variety of reasons that I think contribute to that that I discuss in the book. But the essential point is that if we falter um, in our ability to be able to demonstrate that our claims to fact are true, and that we have robust results that are generated by the work of our faculty. If, if there's a sense that we as an institution are vulnerable or susceptible to the charge that our, our studies are, are not reproducible, are not accurate, then I think we really undercut our standing in society. And that's really a problem um, in terms of, again, if, if we are seen to be tainted in the way that media is increasingly seen in those terms and think tanks are, uh, are seen in those terms, well, who's ultimately going to play the checking role on, on people of power? And, and you know, again, you know, in a, in a moment where we see the hostility that authoritarian leaders have to universities, you know, we're already targeted because we do this role well. But if we don't do it well, um, we just we just we just play into uh, their crusade. And um, and you know, just this you know, a few weeks ago, it was so distressing to see a letter um, on March fourth uh, written by the Russian university rectors in full-throated support of Putin and the military. And it's just again, if we go in this direction. Um, who who's who's left to really um, uh, call out falsity? Um, in your book, you delineate this problem, and then you talk about something called the open science movement, which struck me as a real paradigm change from traditional peer review, which those of us who are academics have grown up with, and is somewhat frustrating, mostly because it is endless. And in the social sciences, it keeps you from being a, you might become a, an intellectual, but you're not a public intellectual because the world goes by while you're still being peer reviewed or published. Can you talk, tell us a little bit about your, the concept of open science? So this is this is a movement that that is that has been underway for several years now, but essentially the idea is that when you publish, you as a faculty member, publish your work, and you can publish it quickly. Anyone can put anything out on the internet, of course. But the idea is if you publish and 
Um, you particularly are dealing with databases where your findings or conclusions are based on the data that you have collected. If you um, are um, willing to not just simply show, or show the conclusions uh, that you derive from the data, but actually putting the data sets out there so that others can test and ascertain whether or not what you've said is accurate. You know, that's a, that's a way in which, to your point, you can expedite the, um, uh, the time to dissemination of findings, but you also can provide a credible assurance to, uh, to the community that, um, that your data is there and, um, and you have the confidence that if people start to probe it, that they're not going to find that there's a disjunction between the conclusions you've drawn and the data you've utilized, and you know this is this is you know more generally um, part of I think a spirit of accountability that you see in other institutions like media. You know, for instance, it, the number of um, good media outlets now that are having their journalists um, and reporters. Uh, putting more of the primary work that they have done in development of their articles online. And so it's open to public scrutiny. I think this is a way, in, again, in which we can bond our commitment to accuracy. And then finally, it's just it's just essentially a movement, as, as you um, indicated in the question you asked, where people can get things out quickly and put it out to, to broad public evaluation and in not have the um, findings sequestered behind paywalls and so forth that mean only certain folks are going to get access to that if they pay the fees that are required to get access to those databases. And again, the hope is that the crowd of experts, much in the way you see in something like Wikipedia, are going to be able to consistently provide accurate assessments of what that um, what those uh, studies um, look like when they're evaluated against uh, the standards of peers. I, I think it's a fascinating movement. And I think you're, you're, for anybody interested in this, the book does a really good job of sort of explaining this alternative. That's a paradigm shift. That is really, that is really a, a big one. Well, look, let's, um, we, we have a couple minutes left. So let's go to a couple of questions that have come in. Um, we have, have someone at the State Department, Carrie, um, asking, how different a role do universities play overseas in promoting democracy? Is there a different model out there? You know, although I write this book primarily in the context of the United States, because it's Canada and the United States are the countries that I know best and it's um, and 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 understand well the fabric of these institutions, I think I think the role of universities in democracy is universal. Um, and again, you know, as one looks at uh, the various ways in which universities can hold power to account, uh, the way they can train citizens for democracy, how they again give opportunities for social mobility and really allow the promise of equal opportunity to be realized. I, 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 I truly think these this is universal, and I think these institutions have universal import. And again, as I referred to a few moments ago, it's not surprising that when you look at um, from you know Mussolini to communist Poland to Hungary, Turkey, and Russia, uh, you know today you, know, you see the extent to which autocratic leaders hate universities. Um, and often they're the first institutions that are targeted for special treatment when they are able to consolidate power. Again, I think that reflects the power of these institutions in really bolstering the fabric of democracy. So I think the truths are here and uh, around the value and the role of universities are truly universal. Um, let's see, we have a question, uh, no name attached. Um, Basically, if democracy is in peril and fragile, how has it gotten to this point? And who is currently leading? How did they choose their first year roommates? <laughs> okay, that's a, a kind of a getting it down to the nub. But, but who's doing a good job of this? In, in terms of institutions that are universities I think, that are- I think what the question means is universities who are doing a good job. Look, I think- 
I, I think what you find is there's lots of great examples. This is the magic of, of an incredibly dynamic uh, system of higher education in the United States where you have public and private universities, small liberal arts colleges, ones that are more technically inclined. There's, I mean, it's such, such a diversity of different institutions and a lot of institutions are taking on pieces of the puzzle. So for instance, on the democracy requirement, um, institutions like Purdue um, uh, have been really interesting in terms of insisting on a graduation requirement that, that, that um, uh, um, requires students can show on graduation that they've mastered some, some rudimentary set of understandings around the nature of democracy. Stanford has recently revised its first year curriculum to provide more um, a more formalized and consistent exposure to uh, democratic uh, principles. Uh, one can think about the institutions that um, have been really active in thinking about ways in which you can promote social mobility. There's a wonderful group that Dan Porterfield um, from Aspen Institute has been leading called the American Talent Initiative, in which uh, more than 100 different universities that uh, are distinguished by the fact that they have very high completion rates. So their students have all banded together to try and increase the number of uh, students who are uh, from Pell eligible backgrounds who are coming to university recently. So there's there's lots of there's lots of experimentation and commitment on a number of these different fronts. Um, the the question is, have we moved to a point though where it's consistent, universal, and, um, and and embodied in every institution in the way that is necessary if we're going to take this moment, this challenge seriously. And that, sadly, the answer is not yet. Um, a, a, another a sort of related question from Sarit Stiaya Ross at USAID. And um, she or he, I per, forgive me for not knowing the what the first name is, um, asks, how do we promote democracy and civic education with youth in such a sensitive and restricting political environment? I mean, we're we're in a touchy, we're in a touchy period of time. And I, I, I agree with the question. I, I like the notion of a democracy requirement, but it, as soon as you begin to operational it, you can operationalize it, you can see the, you know, the the arguments coming right up out of the political environment. You know, um, look at our own country and abroad, there's any number of reasons uh, for people to object to this agenda. Um, you know, it reminds me, like, years ago, I was doing a lot of writing and thinking as a law professor around uh, the role of the rule of law in the developing world. And there's a very robust literature, as you know, that shows countries that have high rule of law scores, surprise, surprise, have better economic performance, better civil liberties, so on and so forth. And so we know what a good rule of law looks like. And it's, um, again, um, one could say, well, let's just, you know, we just got to get more of that in these countries. And uh, in, whether in our own country or internationally, just build a stronger rule of law and everything is solved. And, you know, when you look at the, you know, the nature of the rule of law is really to limit the exercise of arbitrary power. There's no question that there are people who are really hostile to that idea. And even though this has a noble lineage and a really compelling foundation, there's just going to be people um, in power who will resist it. And so I think so to hear that we know that this commitment to liberal democracy means constraints on the exercise of power. It means, um, you know, having to um, support a idea of citizenship, which um, uh, is at the you know, at the very core about freedom and equality. And we know in a lot of countries, um, that's, 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 that's a provocative idea. So I think one has to be realistic that um, whether we're talking in our own country or elsewhere, that um, there are going to be groups and interests that are going to see this as threatening to their interests. And, you know, there, I think it requires some persistence, but some ingenuity at figuring out ways in which we enlist people to uh, support the cause. Okay, we, 
We have an, a, a comment from somebody in the audience suggesting that um, we look at History Disrupted by Jason Steinhauer, a very good read applicable to universities and their challenges. Um, final question, and then I want Ron to sort of summarize his platform. Um, final question is, uh, what are the incentives for universities and colleges to move in the direction of educating citizens? So I think ultimately it's a great question. Um, I think um, the incentive, I think, is, you know, after all, we're institutions that are not um, about profit. We're institutions that are mo motivated by a sense of how we vindicate the public good and how we do better for society. And I think the incentive is simply to be part of um, a solution to our current democratic moment and the sense of the fragility of our democratic institutions where we can say we were part of um, the coalition that basically you know, um, decided to um, understand this moment and to act in a way that it was commensurate with its severity. And I think I think people on the campus um, and I think our, the folks who are graduates of our institutions, I'm hoping will see that they're real bragging rights in being part of that enterprise and taking this moment seriously. And instead of just treating this as something that we, you know, that we analyze and that we're worried about the perilous state of democracy, both domestically and abroad, but saying, you know, we, we actually, we, we, we rolled up our sleeves and, you know, we did some of these things that were hard for these institutions to do, but nevertheless, we recognize the moment and, um, and we were, we, we were, we were part of a solution. And I, I think, I think there's, there's a, a lot of psychic and social reward that comes from that. Good. So Ron, in the last couple minutes, tell us very succinctly your platform. I mean, what would you do? You've, you've, you've brought some of these, um, you've brought up some of these, what would you do to help uh, to, to enlist or to have universities helping in the democratic um, project? So just very succinctly, and thanks for the opportunity, it's first and foremost taking the idea that universities have an indispensable role to play in democracy and that there's an obligation that comes along with that perspective role. It's, uh, it's working harder at social mobility and increasing our access, whether changing programs like legacy or advocating for increases to financial aid investment by the federal government in the form of the Pell loans. It's, um, it's doing the hard work of developing new experiments around a democratic education requirement that we would do at the university level that would supplement what we hope is happening um, at the K-12 level, but not consistently. Um, it's taking our role as stewards of facts seriously, getting at the issues around um, uh, um, the uh, non-reproducibility of our research and setting up structures and mechanisms to um, ensure that our our claims are um, easily substantiated and that um, our work is widely disseminated again in a way that safeguards our uh, truth-finding role. And then finally, um, being really cognizant of the fact that as much as we should feel good about the more diverse communities that we have created on our campuses, that if we don't really get true interaction, engagement across all the different communities that are represented on our campuses, we are really uh, failing to properly model the promise of pluralism and to create a new generation of citizens who are not hostile to difference, but know how to manage it and to thrive in it. There wow. it is, the KTEL version, version of the book. And, and I had actually written that, that I had actually written those things down. <laughs> so, um, so it comes out very clearly. Uh, this is a book everyone must read. Um, as particularly, I think we've got a very strong audience of educators here, if I looked at the at responses. And um, I want to thank Ron for coming to join us at Brookings. And um, everybody have a very nice day. Bye-bye. Thanks, Elaine.